Good afternoon, and welcome to the Midwest Farm Report. Your host today is Jake Jacobson. Well, good afternoon. We have a couple of firsts today. In fact, three firsts today in the Midwest Farm Report. First of all, I'm here, and uh, though I dabble in farm information and farm news now and then, I still have an awful lot to learn about farming, and I hope to do some of that today. And uh, another big first on the program is the gentleman here to my immediate left, and that's Stanley Van Vliet, who is the chairman of the TV committee, and old Stan just stands back there and watches everybody else get out here and suffer. So you're going to do a little suffering today yourself, Stan. And then down there on the far left and the far right of your screen is Ron Irwin from uh, Isabella County, and he's the vice chairman of the National Farmers Organization over there. And Ron, it's nice to have you on the program with us today. You're not nervous at all. and doing it like an old pro stands the guy here that's a, a little shook up right off the bat here. He doesn't know what to do with his hands there for a while. But uh, I think he'll have plenty to say here in a few minutes. And then the gentleman in the middle is Don Trost, the Assistant National Organizational Director of the National Farm Organization. Well, gentlemen, we're here, and I have some questions that I would like to ha ask. Uh, first of all, like I have said before at the beginning of the program, I've dabbled in farm news and a little farming when I was a younger boy, but nothing to the capacity that you gentlemen go at it. And some of the big things that I have been learning about is that uh, farmers are businessmen and pretty big businessmen. Why, what the question I want to say right off the bat, if they're such big businessmen, how come you don't make any money? Well, Jake, I can probably try and give an answer to that question. We are, uh, as you say, big businessmen. We have, it's not uncommon today to find a farmer with, oh, a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars invested in his farming operation. We can't say we aren't making any money, but we don't feel we're getting fairly compensated for the investment and the work that we put into our farming operation. I think your question was the reason for this. We feel it's because the farmers, while they've been producing more every year, producing and producing and producing, we've done nothing about the marketing of our commodities. We've let someone else tell us what price we're going to have for our commodity, and we feel it should be the farmer that puts a price on his product. Don, you had some pretty uh, revealing statistics there and uh, sort of socked me right in the nose and made me sit back and take notice, and that is the comparison between the farm worker and the non-farm worker, the amount of work mm -hmm. that they have achieved and the payments. Could you uh, sort of tell the folks about that? Well, yes. Uh, now, these figures, I've got it from the congressional record, so uh, they were given by Senator Proxmire about a year ago, so I assume they're accurate. And he said that in over the last 10-year period, the output per worker on the farm has doubled, while the income has been cut in half. In this same 10-year period, the output per worker in non-farm income has increased 25%, while the income for non-farm worker has doubled. In other words, farmers are working twice as hard for half as much, while people in non-farm occupations have just increased one-fourth, and they're receiving twice as much as they did 10 years ago. I think Stan is going to work over here already. He's got one of his charts out. Can I uh, help you out with it there, Stan? And you can move in and uh, do a little talking about that. Well, I think the difference... Just uh, hold on here just a minute, Stan. We're coming in with our camera here, and they'll uh, get in there. You can go right ahead now. I think the difference, Jake, uh, is organization and collective bargaining. As we try to illustrate on the, the graph, the hourly earnings in food marketing, how they have increased since 1947, and how the hourly returns of all farm labor and management <coughs> have remained uh, almost the same. In fact, a very little difference from 47 through 63. I see now in food marketing, it's gone mm -hmm. now. They, about 1947, they were both about the same. Oh, it looks to be about a dollar two cents. Is that right? Yes. And then uh, for the hourly earnings for employees in food marketing, it's gone way up to 217. Where here in well, this is up to 1963, the hourly returns and all farm labor and management is a dollar one cent. So it, uh, doesn't look like you've progressed very far there. Jake, no. while you have the chart there, I might also point out the product that the employees in food marketing use to achieve this increase in income is the farmer's product. For example, the uh, men that deliver milk to the homes in Detroit, just as an example, if they want a better price, what do they do? They don't deliver the farmer's milk until they get the price that they want. So they're using the farmer's bargaining power to achieve this level of income where farmers haven't been using this 
bargaining power, and they've stayed at this level. Well, I want to ask you a question, Don. If if you were to use your bargaining power, and I, you call this a holding action, right? Right. Now, if you were to use that, say, with milk, you fellows are going to run into a lot of trouble. People are going to say right off the bat, well, they're holding the milk back, and here's my poor little baby, and it needs some milk. Now, uh, I left the opening there because we talked about this before, and you had very good examples of a couple of stores on the same street. Okay. Um, first of all, you mentioned the point that if farmers hold their milk, they're going to be, uh, on the term as used, you're going to be starving babies. We don't sell our milk to a baby. We sell it to a processor, a, a, a dairy plant. And uh, when this dairy plant is through processing our product and puts it on the market, he doesn't uh, care how loud the baby cries. He puts a price tag on that milk, uh, 22, 24, 25 cents a quart, depending on the area. Now, is this example that you were referring to, uh, we're filming this show in Michigan, Saginaw, Michigan area, and I was living on State Street, which is probably one of the, well, one of the nicer streets and one of the most newly developed streets in, in Saginaw. And in a um, matter of about three blocks, there's a difference in price of eight cents a half gallon. In other words, there's a dairy store there that has milk for sale at 33 cents a half gallon. There's another store there about three blocks away that has milk for sale at 41 cents a half gallon. This is eight cents a quart difference, or eight cents a half gallon difference, which would be four cents a quart difference. Or breaking this back to the farmer, the farmer sells 50 quarts of milk, 100 pounds of milk, for around $4 a hundred. If the farmer were to get this increase of four cents a quart, on the farm it would amount to $2 a hundred more for the milk that he has for sale. In other words, people are paying this difference in prices today but the farmers aren't realizing any increase in price. Okay, now what can the farmers do about this? Well, uh, of course the answer here is collective bargaining. We feel the answer is collective bargaining. Getting together so that we can put a price on our product based on cost of production. Actually, all we're trying to do is the same thing the man in the grocery store does. We don't walk into a grocery store and say, we'll give you 15 cents a quart for milk, he says the price is 22 cents a quart or 24 cents a quart or whatever it happens to be. Uh, it's basically the American principle of the producer putting the price on the product. And as we say, of course, we can't do it as individuals. We'll have to do it on an organized basis as a group. Now, what are you trying to tell me here, Don, that uh, the, the uh, company comes out and picks up the milk and then tells you what they're going to pay you for it? Well, yeah, to carry it even a little further, uh, Ron's probably got something he wants to say on this, too. But to carry it a little further, um, if we walk into a grocery store, pick up a quart of milk, walk over to the counter and lay down 15 cents, or, well, the farmer's getting about 8 cents a quart. Let's say we give him twice what the farmer gets. We lay down 16 cents and walk out with that quart of milk, there'd be a cop after us pretty quick. You're stealing milk. But yet, this is exactly how the farmer markets. He has a bulk tank of milk in his milk house. The dairy sends a truck out there, back up to the farmer's milk house, plug into his electricity, use the farmer's electricity to pump this milk out of the bulk tank into the tank truck, and then a month and a half later, they send him a check for whatever they think the milk is worth. Uh, it's actually, it's the same principle on a larger scale. Well, not only in milk now, I know in, in cattle too, and uh, Ron had a very good oh. example. Could I see those? Uh, slips that you have right there. This uh, sort of amazed me here. Just to pass them down, and I'll try to... Thank you. Here in 1958, a 1,400-pound cow. Is this a cow that was sold, Ron? Was yes. that it? It was sold for $284.20. That's a 1,400-pound cow. Now, in 1964, in November 23rd of 1964, a cow that weighed exactly 35 pounds more, 1,435 pounds, was sold, and this seems unbelievable to me, for $57.88. Now, that's uh, some 200 and, uh, oh, we'll call it around $237 there, $236 less. How come? I think due to our lack of bargaining power. I feel that they were quite good to me, even at the $57.88, because I didn't ask them for anything more. I. Uh, just unloaded this cow at the yards, and whatever they were willing to give me, I was willing to accept. Well, why is that, Ron? Now, this, this is the thing I can't understand now. Well, individually, if I were to feed 50,000 head of cattle, I would be a small percentage of, of 
small fraction of 1% of the total of market. Yet there are processors that process 18% of the total market. Now, this gives me no bargaining power on my own at all. Uh, it has to be done as a group through collective bargaining. Now, if, if the group gets together, say uh, you're from Isabella County, say all the farmers in Isabella County get together, and they're going to hold their cattle off the market until they get a little better price. Now, I understand you're not asking for the sky or anything like this. Now, this is this holding action we're talking about. What uh, keeps a farmer from, uh, well, let's say one of the other counties, uh, we won't pick one out here, but say from your next door neighbor, from selling, from taking his cattle in there and selling them? Well, in the first place, I think we're all neighbors, regardless of where we live, in state or county or anything, because we're all in the same business. We all have got to get together and do this collectively. Uh, actually, there's nothing that will stop this uh, neighbor from taking his meat to uh, market. Uh, this will be entirely his choice. Uh, I think, though, if he understands what we're trying to do, thoroughly understands it, that we are just asking for prices that we've already received in the past. We're not asking for any increase in price. I think that he will go along with this uh, type of a program. Now, one, one thing I want to ask here, too, is that, uh, Don, when we were talking before the show, you, you brought up a very good point. that You had been talking to a, a, a farmer, a, a little older farmer than you fellas, and uh, your, your big aim is to get the farmers together. That's right. the National Farmers Organization, is to get them together so that they will have a bargaining power. And uh, he said that this isn't anything new. Well, this is very true. Uh, the statement I used, I think, was that the man said he was one year from re retirement age, which would mean he'd be 64 years old. And uh, he said, and I think most of the farmers can remember this, he said that uh, uh, the farmers used to go together and, well, thrashing, for example. They'd have a thrashing machine, and one farmer would own a thrashing machine, and eight or ten of the neighbors would get together and they'd thrash their grain together. And uh, same way uh, when it came to building a barn, the farmers would all get together and they'd build a barn. One would help, you help me out, and I'll help you out. Then as farmers became mechanized and they got their individual machinery on their farms, each farmer started to become a unit by himself, just operating by himself. And uh, the, an old elevator man made a statement one time. He said, I can buy any farmer in the state for a nickel. By this he meant that if he'd offer one farmer a nickel more than his neighbor, his neighbor would think he was sitting on top of the world. And by using this type of, of pressure, they were able to get farmers competing with each other. And as they got farmers competing with each other, they were able to start lowering the prices to the level that we've indicated here of $57 for a cow that uh, six years ago, eight years ago was worth 280 some dollars. Now we're getting to the crux of it here. Uh, like you say, farmers are big businessmen. They, they have to manage a lot of money. They have to manage a lot of area, and a lot of equipment, a lot of animals. And they're competing against one another in this big management. Now, if they start to organize, they get it together, they can start asking for a little better price in some of their things. Now, the first question we're going to get from the consumer is, well, if the farmers start asking more, we're going to have to pay more. Is this true? Yes, I suppose it is to a certain degree. We can't escape the fact. And we accept this in every other commodity. We expect an automobile to be a little higher next year. We, we don't expect the landlord to lower the rent. If he's going to do anything, he's going to raise the rent. But it isn't going to be such a terrific amount. Uh, we're getting, and Stan, maybe we could use your chart right in here to outline part of this. Uh, if you want to use the pointer there, maybe I can explain a little bit of it. The farmers have 87% of the investment in the food industry, and they're receiving 37% of the consumer's food dollar. The processors and the retailing industry have only 13% investment, and they're receiving 63% of the consumer's food dollar. The point I want to make from this graph is that the farmer is getting relatively a small percentage of the consumer's food dollar. Now, a slight increase in the value of the farm products in many cases could be absorbed by the processing industry, but I don't want to give the impression that it's all going to be absorbed. 
the thing I think we should point out here is that 10 years ago, people, the average non-farm consumer, was spending 25% of his take-home pay for food. Today, they're only spending 19% of their take-home pay for food. This compares with, uh, well, the United Kingdom, which is Great Britain in those countries, is the next closest country in the world where the consumer spends 29.5% of his take-home pay for food. In other words, farmers are, we're, we hear a lot of talk about the government subsidizing farmers, when the fact of the matter is the farmers are subsidizing the rest of the economy by providing food so cheap. People only have to spend one-fifth of their income for the most essential commodity, which is food, something everyone has to have. It's a basic necessity. And by providing food at these low prices, people are able to have boats, trailers, go skiing on the weekend, camping, all these things that we enjoy in America today. What we are uh, trying to get across here today is while people are enjoying these things, many farmers are not. They're tied to a dairy herd that means they have to be there seven days a week, and they're not getting compensated. On a, com on a level comparable with the rest of the economy. Well, now let me ask Stan this. Stan, I, I, I can see where uh, you fellows want, want to make a little more money. And uh, I suppose it's up to the individual just how much he wants to, to make with it. Uh, but a lot of people ask when they, when they give you a raise, what are you going to do with it? What, what do you think the farmer is going to do with the money? Well, he's going to spend it, Jake. Uh, there's no question about it. Farmer's that. known for that sort of thing, Stan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's going to pay those bag bills, and uh, in addition, he's going to buy. Uh, we have uh, what was a, a terrific potential in, uh, in agriculture that would stimulate, uh, I say stimulate, it would not only help farmers, but it would help uh, industry and the consumer as well. <clears throat> well, I think Ron had uh, some good examples over there at Isabella County. Uh, I don't know if you were speaking just about Isabella County or not, but about industry and looking for industry, and they have an industry and don't even know what it is. And what's that, Ron? Well, <clears throat> we need more industry as far as that goes, but uh, last year in Isabella County, there were uh, uh, approximately $15 million worth of farm products sold out of it. And uh, feeling the way we do about our prices, uh, this would be about 30% under what we figure they should bring. And uh, figuring it this way, probably at least 90% of that money it was spent in Isabella County for fertilizer, feeds, seeds, building materials, our own uh, living costs, and things like this. And uh, at that rate, there was approximately $4 million that left the county that could have been there to have been spent for schools, taxes, any number of things. And uh, I feel that while we're looking for industry, that we have the industry right here, and we're not taking care of it. Now, we've been talking about uh, some of the things that uh, are happening, why, why you want a little better price, the reasons for it. I think most of the farmers that are looking in know this. We don't, we don't have to tell them that. Uh, maybe some of the consumers are watching are a little surprised at some of the facts and figures. Don, you're a, a younger farmer. You said you just started farming back about 1958, is that right? right. Well, now, what do you foresee for the future? Are, are you looking for things to, to get worse, or are you looking for things to be better? Well, I'm going to base this answer on the reception that we've had to the NFO program, especially in the area that we're working in right now. Uh, more and more farmers all the time are coming together in the NFO, getting together to work together so we can achieve our fair share of the nation's economy. Based on this, I think agriculture has a tremendous future. Either way, agriculture does have a tremendous future. Uh, the story or the statement was made here this evening that by the year 2000, we're going to have to increase our production 100% in order to supply this increasing population that we have. There seems to be a race on at the present time as to who's going to be in control of agriculture, farmers or big business. Uh, there's a trend toward big business getting into it. We feel it should be the individual farmer having control of agriculture. The, the small businessman is the term I suppose you would use as a, as a farmer, having, being the producer of agricultural products just as we have in the past. We've been told we should get more efficient and that the small farm cannot be efficient, that it's the big farm, the, the large operation that is efficient. But this is not true. The actually, the, what we call a family-sized farm, a unit of land 
and buildings and machinery that can be operated by a farmer and his family is the most efficient producing unit we have in this country. Ron, or Don, that's one thing I wanted to bring up. Everything, like, like you say, everybody says, well, the trend now is to bigger farms, but less farms. And you say now that this doesn't have to be, is that right? This is right. Uh, well, we've eliminated half of the farmers in the last 10 years. It hasn't solved the farm problem. In other words, we've got half as many farmers now as we had 10 years ago. But it hasn't solved the farm problem. We're getting less now than we did 10 years ago. So we feel we've gone about as far as we dare go on this matter of producing more and getting bigger. We feel it's time we got together and started to price our product. Uh, well, maybe that's all I have to say right now. Oh, one, one, one thing I want to ask about that, Don, is, uh, and maybe uh, Stan can help here too, because Stan brought up a fact that I, I didn't realize and we keep hearing about holding actions all the time. And every time someone mentions the word, everybody gets a little uneasy, and it, uh, some tempers start to flare, and uh, uh, some friends are no longer friends for a couple of weeks or so. But uh, and that is a, a holding action to hold something off the market. And Stan says, well, I do that half the year. And uh, a lot of farmers do it, and they probably don't even look at it as that. But they are participating in a holding action, and that's with your milk. Is that right, Stan? And, and how, do, how do you do that? Every other day, is that Every it? Every other day, we uh, have a bulk pickup. Uh, we don't think of it as uh, being a holding action because we're simply holding it uh, two days uh, for it to be picked up and taken to market. But uh, we are holding. Uh, <coughs> we are holding the milk uh, half, half of the year. Well, now, uh, the holding action is, is the word that I, I'm most familiar with. That's the word. I know, but are there other ways that uh, you fellows can get together and to, to get the price you, you think that you're worth or, or somewhere near it, other than a holding action where uh, you're going to have uh, a few unfriendly neighbors or uh, people around and saying, well, there, there they are again. The NFO's got another holding action going. Well, I think there is, Jake. I, uh, the only thing standing between uh, this program and uh, Reality is uh, a state of mind, just uh, reaching people. Well, what is it? Does the farmer feel that, uh, and uh, this is no aspersions on anyone personally, but does he feel that he's not as, as good as the next businessman? Does he feel that he can't command that price? Or, or just, what is it? Does he have an inferiority complex? Or is he afraid that uh, the farmer down the road isn't going to like what he's doing? Or is he just afraid to make the decision? Uh, Jake, don't you think, um, uh, let me answer it this way, this is what I think. You know, when the rubber tire tractors first came out, the farmers said those are the worst thing that you can ever do. If you get a rubber tire tractor, it'll pack the ground so hard you'll never be able to plow it. You'll poison the ground. The same thing was said about chemical fertilizers when they came out. They said, don't use chemical fertilizers, it'll, 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 you just won't get any crop, it won't work. And any new idea in farming that has come along has met with this type of of, of opposition. I don't think this is true just of farmers. I think it's true in, with people in general. It takes time for the public to accept a new idea, and NFO is definitely a new idea in marketing. And I think this is our problem. It's a matter of there's not enough farmers that have had an opportunity to have the program explained to them so that they understand it. Because we say that once a farmer understands it, he'll join NFO. This is what we need. This is something we've been looking for for years, a program of this type. Well, I like I like the <coughs> phrase that you used there, Don. NFO is a new idea in marketing, and uh, I think that's that's just exactly w what what you have behind it. That's that's the principle. Now, how how are you going to get these farmers to 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 join an NFO? What do they have to do to join? If they're I know that a lot of them have been thinking at times, well, maybe I should get in an organization. Maybe I should become a little bit bigger businessman by by joining an organization to give us a little more bargaining power there. How does he go about joining NFO? Well, of course, we have a large number of members in the area. The, uh, there are people working down the road, and we're starting on a drive, we will be shortly, uh, where farmers will be going out on the road and contacting other farmers that are not members of the organization and explaining the program to them. But at this time, if any farmer is interested in joining the organization, we're asking him, don't wait until someone comes to you. We are short on manpower. We're short on help, in other words, to get out and do the job. If you're interested in the program, at the end of this television program, there'll be a place uh, designated where you can write to to find out more about the NFO, 
and we will be setting up meetings in the area, which we'll announce a little bit later in the show here, where farmers can come to the meeting, find out about the program. This is all we're asking anyone to do, is just come to us, come to our meetings, find out about our program, and make your own decision as to whether or not you join the organization. Well, our time is running uh, just too fast here for us. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes uh, left, but I would like to ask each one of you the same question. I'd like to start down there with Ron. Do you think NFO is going to do it, Ron? I think that NFO has got to do it. I think that uh, uh, when the farmer starts to realize that his commodity is used, uh, it has a price set on it, after everybody else handles it, every handler that takes this product sets his price on it, I think the only way the farmer can compete in this highly competitive society is to put a price on it first. He has it first, and he's going to have to do this. I think that, as Don said, this is an educational program. Where there are monthly meetings, and uh, more often in some cases held in most every county. And if these farmers would come out and just listen and ask questions, I think that this would, would do it. I think so. Stan, what about you? Do you think NFO is going to do it? Yes, they do, Jake. <coughs> Excuse me. I think the uh, farmer's going to have to start managing his own business rather than uh, just uh, being an operator uh, and letting someone else take care of the business in. Uh, well, that's going to be a new, that means a new education for him almost, doesn't it? Uh, I know uh, we haven't got uh, too much time to go in that. Maybe that's something we should have gone into and we can at a later date. But it is. It's a new thing for him. He's going to have to educate himself to, to do it. Not that he can't do it, but it's... He's going to have to come in from the field now and then and, and spend a little time. Uh, Don, what about you? I know you're, you're a younger fellow. You're starting out in farming, like you said, in 1958, and you plan to make it your career, so you right. must believe in NFO. Well, definitely. I, uh, I think these fellows have both explained it very well, where they said it has to work. It has to work. There's no reason it won't work. It works for everyone else today. It's a simple matter of the farmers getting together to put a price on their product. Just no different than the grocery store man. I think this is the best example there is. The man that owns the grocery store doesn't per put his production on the shelf and say, what will you pay for it? He puts it on the shelf and says, this is the price we have to have in order to cover our cost and stay in business. And this is all we're doing in NFO. Don, I know there are a few meetings around. Would you like to uh, give them the meetings at this time? Well, we'll have a meeting next Tuesday evening. This will be... January 19th at the Munger Town Hall. This is right out here north of, the, uh, north of the TV station here. And there'll be a meeting next Wednesday over at Hemlock, at the Hemlock High School. Good. Well, I want to thank Stanley Van Vliet, the chairman of the TV committee. And how's it feel to be on TV, Stan? <laughs> <laughs> and also Don Trost, the assistant national organizational director of NFO, and Ron Irvin, the vice chairman of the Isabella County NFO. And uh, this is Jake Jacobson, your host. There we are over there. And we want you to join us again next week for the Midwest Farm Report. And I've been enlightened today. I hope you have too. And remember, the NFO needs you. <laughs>